Today's speaker, Alessandro Acquisti, uh, will be speaking on Facebook and social media. Uh, the talk is titled, Faces of Facebook, Privacy in the Age of Augmented Reality. Please join me in welcoming Alessandro Acquisti. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. And thank you for being here. Uh, it's always a, a great pleasure to be a black hat. And uh, in this case, I would like to mention my co-authors, Ralph Gross and Fred Stutzman. Um, this talk is about uh, a few things. Um, face recognition, for sure. That's uh, where we start from. Uh, but face recognition is, is, is just a start. Uh, what we were interested in uh, studying was the uh, not so distant uh, uh, consequences and implications of the convergence of a number of technologies. One of the other technologies are online social networks. And uh, combined with uh, a few more ingredients that you will see through my presentation, the story we are trying to tell is a story of augmented reality, of a blending of online and offline data, which I find uh, inevitable, and which raises uh, pretty uh, deep and uh, uh, concerning uh, privacy questions. So this is what the talk is about. But I will start uh, not from the talk itself, but from the future. And this is a movie that we have all seen, all right? Minority Report. Uh, Tom Cruise uh, walking around a future shopping mall. I believe that in the movie version of uh, Philip K. Dick's story, it was 2054. And somehow the advertising is uh, uh, changed and adapted in real time based on uh, a combination of technologies, including face recognition and iris scan. So customers walking in the mall are recognized, uh, advertising is targeted. The same way now, online advertising is targeted based on your online behavior. But there is also another side uh, to this future in the movie, uh, the creepier side, where uh, high-risk scan is used for surveillance, identifying and uh, detecting people. So keep in mind these two images, these two potential futures we are walking into, uh, they are not mutually exclusive. Uh, keep them in mind, I will go back to these, but in the meanwhile, I will jump back into the past uh, uh, I think the best uh, summary of the state of facial recognition today was given actually by another uh, black hat DEF CON speaker last year, uh, Joshua Marpet. He said, facial recognition sucks, but it's getting better. And I would uh, strongly subscribe to these words. Uh, computers are still uh, way worse than humans in recognizing faces, but they keep getting better. They can still be fooled. Uh, DEF CON uh, had a presentation, I believe, last year or two years ago. A uh, pretty smart idea, uh, putting some LEDs on a hat that was sufficient to uh, confuse uh, a uh, face recognizer. And this was part of the, you know, the badge uh, um, competition at DEF CON. But that said, uh, granted that face recognizers still somewhat suck, also granted that their first derivative is clear. They keep getting better and better. So research in this area has been going on for more than uh, 40 years. And uh, they keep getting better, so much so that they start being used in real applications. Uh, not just in security, but in fact, also, more recently, in Web 2.0 applications. And in fact, if you see what has been happening in the past uh, uh, few months, uh, or at most couple of years, um, pretty much every startup doing good work in face recognition has been acquired either by Google or by Facebook or, or by Apple. Um, Google has acquired Neven Vision a few years ago and then more recently Ria, and then even more recently PitPat. Uh, PitPat is actually interesting because it's the software that we use for our experiments. Uh, it was developed not by us, by uh, researchers at CMU, uh, where I'm from, and then uh, pretty much after our experiments were done a few weeks ago, we heard the news that PitPat had just been acquired by Google. Similar story with Polar Rose by Apple and Facebook didn't acquire Facebook.com but licensed its technology to, and started using it in uh, automated tagging and so forth. So there is obviously a very significant commercial interest as well as governmental, governmental interest in face recognition. So what are we doing that is potentially slightly new or different? Well, 
we took this view, I'm a researcher, I'm a privacy researcher, I'm not a face recognition researcher, although Ralph Gross, my co-author, is. We took this view of uh, extrapolating five, ten years out to what will be possible to do with face recognition, online social network, cloud computing, and uh, statistical re-identification in data mining. So, in a way, the mix, the mashup of these technologies is what can create. And this is why. First of all, as I already mentioned a couple of times, face recognition keeps improving. Uh, the ferret program, the Department of Defense uh, program for, um, to create metrics uh, for the accuracy and uh, the performance of a face recognizer, clearly shows that even just in five years, between, actually close to 10 years, between 97 and 2006, there were improvements of around two orders of magnitude. If you see the data now, although I do not know that the FERRA program has happened recently, but if you see the performance of face recognizers now, has gone up as well, dramatically. All the while, something which we didn't have uh, much in 2006, not that much, and definitely we didn't have in 1997, was the incredible amount of uh, personal information that you can find about strangers online, and in particular, photos. Um, in 2000, and this is a statistics I found in uh, Science, the, the peer-reviewed um, journal, um, in 2000, there were about 100 billion photos shot worldwide. Uh, the, the researchers who estimated this number did it in a very smart way. They, they found data for the sales uh, worldwide of uh, camera um, 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 shots, um, and then they estimated from that the number of shots which could have been made that year. Almost uh, a, only a negligible portion of those 100 billion shots made it online. But in fact, uh, 10 years later, only Facebook users in just a month were uploading 2.5 billion photos. Uh, many of those photos were, of course, uh, depicting faces. And many of those faces could be connected to an identity because either were primary profile photos or they were tagged with someone name. And in fact, uh, many Facebook users use their real first and last name when they uh, create an account on the, um, on the network. I'm going to go back to this pretty important issue in a few slides. Other technologies that we are considering this uh, big mashup uh, mash of, uh, of uh, um, um, which creates the, problem, the, the, the problems uh, this uh, study is about. Statistical re-identification. So statistical identification started, if, if, if I had to give a, a birth date to it, would be probably 1997, when uh, Latanya Zwini, at the time she was uh, at MIT, and then she moved on to uh, Carnegie Mellon as a professor, she discovered something that, if you look back now, it seems obvious, but truly, at the time when she came out with this idea, was revolutionary. She took uh, people's date of birth, which are personal information, but not unique personal information. She took people's gender, which again is personal information, but not personal identifying information. And she took people's zip code, the address where they live, which once again is personal, but not unique. And combining the three, she found that 87% of American population were uniquely identified by the combination of the three pieces of data. If you imagine this as a Venn diagram, you find out that many of us are indeed uniquely identified by these three pieces of data. This is an example of the power of statistical identification to um, start from data which is uh, not particularly sensitive and create something which is potentially more sensitive, such as your unique identity. Uh, the Netflix Prize uh, research by Narayan Eshmatikov was another very famous example. Um, the, the, the scholars took data from the Netflix Prize, uh, which had been uh, anonymized, so uh, ratings of movies without the uh, identity of the rater combine it and compare it to data from the Internet Movie Database and show that they could re statistically re-identify a significant proportion, statistically significant proportion of the members of the Netflix set. And then, of course, our own research, two years ago, we were here at Black Hat, and we presented a study where we showed that we could predict social security numbers from public data. And in fact, for instance, from online social networks profile. And the story here was that we could start from something personal, but not so sensitive, your date of birth and your state of birth, 
combine it with also publicly available data, such as the death master file, which is a database of social security numbers for people who are dead, and by combining the two and doing some uh, statistical analysis, we could end up predicting the SSN, not of the dead people, but of people who were alive. Another technology, cloud computing. Cloud computing allows cheaply and efficiently to run uh, many, many, many face comparisons in just a few seconds. Uh, otherwise, they would not be possible with normal computers. And ubiquitous computing. The idea that I can just take my smartphone and connect it to the internet, and although my smartphone does not have the processing power to do 500 million face comparison in 10 seconds, something up there in the cloud can, and I just need to connect to it to run face recognition in real time in the street. So this is what we are talking about. Combining all these technologies, and in particular face recognition and publicly available on social network data, for the purpose of large-scale automated peer-based uh, individual identification online and offline and uh, individual information inference, the inference of additional information about these individuals, potentially sensitive data. So the taxonomy here I'm trying to, to, to go through is that there is face detection. A computer detects a face in the image. There is face recognition. A computer detects uh, and finds another image, uh, another face matching the first uh, face. And then there is identification. The computer is able to give a name to the face in the image. And then there is facial inferences. Not just we give a name, but we tell something more about that person. We start from an anonymous piece of data, your face, and we create something more. So this is how it works in a nutshell. Imagine that there are, as often in the literature on statistical re-identification, two databases, a unidentified database and a identified database. In uh, Latanya Zwini's example, the identified database was the voter registration list for Massachusetts voters. The unidentified database was a sensitive database of medical discharge data. Obviously unidentified because hospitals wanted to share that information, but they didn't want to share it with uh, uh, the names of the people suffering from the different disease. Latanya showed that you could connect the two. So in our story, the unidentified database could be images that you find on uh, maybe Match.com, a dating site, or maybe Adult Friend Finder, a Dating Plus website, or <laughs> Prosper.com, a financial site where people look for you know, micro uh, funding, micro loans, and often use photos because some research has shown that profiles, profiles with photos are more likely to get funding. But they don't use their names because they often reveal sensitive information about themselves, such as their credit scores. Of course, unidentified faces are also your and my faces when we walk in the street. To a stranger, we are an anonymous face. And then there are, of course, the identified databases. And I would argue that for most of you in this room, for most of us, there are already somewhere up in the internet identified facial images. Uh, they may come from Facebook. If you have joined Facebook, put a photo of yourself and your real name. They could come from LinkedIn. They could come from organizational rosters and so forth. Face recognition finds a match between the two images of uh, possibly the same person. And because of this, we can use the identified database to give a name to a record in an up till then unidentified database. But not only that, the story we're telling is that with the personal information that you find online, once you have a name, you can look for more information, such as maybe the social security number, or maybe the sexual orientation, a paper coming out, um, which came out a couple of years ago, show how could you, you could predict sexual, sexual orientation of Facebook users based on the orientation of their friends, or maybe credit scores. And because of this, if you're able to infer information for the identified database, uh, and if you're able to find a match through recognition to the unidentified database, uh, you close the circle, you end up connecting the sensitive data to the unidentified up till then anonymous uh, person. So this is the story in a nutshell. So the story is that your face is truly the very, is the conduit, is really the very veritable linkage between your offline persona and your online persona, or personas, your many online identities, because uh, well, Eric Schmidt said that maybe when, uh, when we turn 18, uh, we should be allowed to change our names to you know, recreate from scratch our reputation. Well, the problem is that it's much harder to change your face. 
your face is a constant which connects these, these, these different personas. And as I mentioned, for most of us, there are already identified facial image, images online. So the question is, uh, is the combination of technologies which I described going to allow these linkages? Linkages where it's not just that we give name to an uh, anonymous face, but we actually blend together this online and offline data. And I'm really stressing the point because the social security number application I will show in a few seconds is just one example. We chose it because uh, we thought it would be helpful to drive home the point. But it's really one example of what is going to happen, this blending of online and offline data. This emergence of personally predictable information that in a way is written on your face, even if you may not be aware of. This may democratize surveillance. Uh, and I'm not saying this uh, with a good sense. I'm saying this with concern in that we are not, not talking simply of uh, uh, constricted and restrained web 2.0 applications that are limited to consenting opt-in users, uh, such as maybe Picasa or currently Facebook tagging. We are talking about a world where anyone in the street could in fact uh, recognize your face and make these inferences because the data is really already out there. It's already publicly available. So what will uh, our privacy means mean in this kind of future, in this augmented reality future? And we already created uh, de facto real ID infrastructures. Uh, tendentially, Americans are against uh, real IDs, but have we, be, uh, have we already created one through the marketplace? So as I move on to describing the actual experiments that we ran to debate uh, these uh, questions I, po I posit, I want to stress uh, some of the themes I already highlighted in these uh, in, in this, uh, previous slides. Because I really hope that what we remain of this presentation will not be simply the numerical results of the experiments, but what they imply for the future, because I feel that what we are presenting is, in a way, a prototype. It's a proof of concept. But uh, five, ten years out, uh, this is really what is going to happen. Your face is the conduit between online and offline world. The emergence of personal predictive information. The race of visual facial search, searches. Search engine allowing the search for faces. Google already allows, uh, recently started allowing uh, pattern-based searches on images, but not faces yet. The democratization of surveillance. Social network profiles and real IDs, and indeed uh, the future of privacy in a world of augmented reality. So let me talk about the experiment. We did three experiments. The first one was an experiment in online to online identification. So taking a picture from an online database, which was um, anonymous, or perhaps I should say pseudonymous, comparing it to an online database uh, which was uh, ostensibly identified and see what we get from the combination of the two. The second was online to offline. Actually, I should, I should have changed that. It's offline to online, because we started from an offline photo, and we compare it to an online database. And the last one was uh, the next step. Uh, if you can go to sensitive inference, inferences starting from an offline page. The online database, which is identified, which we use across the experiment, were uh, Facebook profiles. Why did we use Facebook profiles? We could have used others. You know, LinkedIn also profiles have, uh, often, uh, not always, uh, images and names. But Facebook in, partic in particular is interesting because uh, if you read the privacy policy of Facebook, it really tells you that Facebook is designed to make it easy for you to find and connect with others. For this reason, your name and profile pictures do not have privacy settings, meaning that uh, you cannot change uh, how visible your primary profile photo is. If you have a photo of yourself as your primary profile photo, anyone will see it. You cannot change that. And in fact, uh, most users do use uh, primary profile photos, which include the photos of themselves. Not only that, Many users, according to our estimate, 90%, and you will see the results later, use their real first and last name on Facebook profile. So you see where I'm going, this, uh, this story of the real ID, uh, de facto real ID. So in this first experiment, we mine data from public images from uh, Facebook, and we compare it to uh, images from one of the most popular dating sites in the US. Um, the recognizer that we use for this application, as I mentioned earlier, is called PitPath. It was developed at CMU. Uh, it's been acquired around 10 days ago from Google, by Google. 
it does two things. First, face detection, and then face uh, recognition. Detection is finding a face in, uh, in a picture. Recognition is matching to other faces according to some matching scores. The Facebook profiles were identified. Interestingly, we did not even log onto the Facebook to download these images. Um, we wanted to show, really, uh, that this can be done uh, with, without even getting into the network. So we use uh, uh, the, an API, the API of a popular search engine to look for Facebook profiles likely to be in a certain geographical area. So that the only thing which, could, which we could access of the Facebook profile was what is publicly available directly on the search engine, which is uh, for people who make themselves searchable on search engines so from Facebook, your primary profile photo and uh, your name. Uh, by the way, most users do make themselves uh, uh, searchable on search engine, uh, make their profile searchable. It's also the default setting. And uh, as we know from uh, uh, behavior decision research, people tend to stick with the default setting. We had a noisy profile search pattern, so we had to write code trying to infer who were these people in this geographical area in North American city. It used to be a few years ago that this task would have been much easier because Facebook at the time had uh, actively uh, uh, was actively using regional networks. This is no longer the case. However, we have something such as current location, which we use, plus we use another combination of searches, such as whether they were a member of, for instance, colleges in the same area, whether they were a fan of companies in a certain area, and so forth. But obviously, this is a noisy search. Um, we found, uh, for the city I'm talking about, uh, close to 280,000 profiles. And uh, out of them, uh, we found uh, 274,000 uh, images. So only a very, very small proportion of them didn't have any image as a primary profile photo. And uh, Pete Pat, face recognizer, detected images in uh, slightly less than 50% of them. So found the so-called templates, so unique identified faces in 110,000, um, uh, for, for, found 110,000 faces or templates. The second database was the dating site, not identified, because uh, people, uh, members of dating site, uh, of course, you use photos, but also use pseudonyms. You have to use a photo if you want to go out on a date, because uh, research has shown that if you don't, uh, the chances that someone replies to your invitation out are pretty slim. However, people don't like to put their real name. There is still an element of social stigma. Therefore, people use pseudonyms online in an online dating site. However, because they use their facial frontal photos, they can be identified by friends who happen to be on the same dating site or perhaps by strangers. Now, if you had to do this manually, it would be unrealistic, impossible. Uh, you would have uh, hundreds of millions of fake com face comparisons to do. So no human being can really take the time of uh, having one browser open on Facebook and the other browser open on the dating site uh, and hope to find matches. But of course, it is not a problem for a computer especially when you start using the power of cloud computing because it allows uh, millions of face comparisons in, uh, in, uh, in, sec in seconds. So for the dating site, we found uh, we use a pattern based on, uh, uh, unlike uh, Facebook, which, which was well, uh, based on, uh, on keyword searches, here was basically on geographical search with the search engine of the dating site. So we look for profiles within the so-called urbanized area of the same Ameri North American city. We found close to 6,000 profiles, and the pit path detected faces for uh, the vast majority of them, close to 5,000. So this is actually what we did. Uh, these, these, these are fake images, by the way. I'm, I'm not exposing the, you know, the private data of real uh, dating site users. We start from a dating site uh, image. We compare it to an image we found on Facebook, and we end up finding the Facebook profile, and therefore we give a name to the person on the dating site. Now, the overlap uh, between the two sets is obviously noisy. Why? Because uh, remember, our search for the Facebook profile uh, uh, was based on keywords, not really geographical uh, search. So it was a little bit noisy. We cannot know exactly the overlap between the two. There is uh, inherent noise. Plus, we also don't know what the ground truth is, in the sense that we don't know exactly how many Facebook users are also members of the dating site and how many members of the dating site are also members of Facebook. So before we actually ran the experiment that I was describing, and, and here I'm stepping back for a second, we ran a survey online. Actually, we ran two surveys online. 
one with uh, subjects, uh, uh, users, participants from the same geographical area I'm talking about, and one uh, with a somewhat nationally representative sample, somewhat because I'm presenting this data more as an order of magnitude approximation. And what we asked was uh, questions such as, are you on Facebook, are you on these dating sites, how long have you been, and so forth. So what we found is that for the people in the city we were studying, all the people who were on uh, the dating site uh, were also on Facebook, uh, although the sample size there was pretty small. Uh, across all, all, all our subjects, only a small percentage were on the dating site. Nationwide, we got similar percentages in the sense that 90% of the people who admitted being on the dating site were also on Facebook. And about 4% uh, of all our subjects were on this particular dating site. If we, currently, if we include those who mentioned that they had been in the past on the dating site, the percentage goes up to 16%. We also ask, without asking the actual names, because this was all anonymous, on Facebook, do you use your real first and last name? So take it as you may, this is, uh, you know, there is always an element of uh, um, self-selection in this kind of surveys. But the results we got is that 90% of our subjects said that, yes, they were using their real name on Facebook. And this data matches pretty well a study that uh, Ralph Gross and I did a few years ago. This one was limited on CMU students, and we pretty much got the sa very same percentage, 89% of users. In that case, we were able to verify the numbers because we could, we could compare the answers to the subjects to the survey to the actual profiles existing on Facebook or CMU network. So it seems to be a relatively robust percentage. Notice that PitPath had to do a pretty large number of, com of comparisons because uh, more than 500 million potential pairs because we were comparing each photo coming from Facebook to each photo coming from uh, the dating site. Uh, we conservatively considered focus only on the best matching pair found for the dating profile, meaning that um, you have the f image from the dating profile and you could have a list of uh, 1,000, uh, long list of potentially matching Facebook profiles, we would only consider the very top in the sense that the image from the Facebook profile with the highest matching score found by PitPath. The matching scores that PitPath produces are between minus 1.5, which means that totally not a match, like uh, uh, one black image, one white image, to 20, pretty much the same JPEG, the same file. We crowdsource to Amazon uh, Mirror Tarkers a validation to the PitPath scores because we wanted some external validation. So we basically created a script where we had mTarkers we found, who couldn't know where this data came from. There were no names, of course, attached to the images. They had to rank it on a Likert scale, one to five, whether they found uh, that the matches found by a pit path were definitely a match, likely a match, I'm not sure, likely not a match, definitely not a match. We also inserted, as you know, there, are, uh, there has been quite a bit of research on uh, using MTARC properly because uh, some people on MTARC are very good, diligent workers, and some people are just unbelievable cheaters. So there are a number of strategies that we have developed over time, and others have developed over time, to cut out the cheaters. In addition to the traditional strategies which are used, such as trick questions before the survey even starts, such as how many people are in this photo? And then uh, in a small font. Uh, the photo contains three people, okay, in the small font. Uh, you have to choose four, because if you choose three, like uh, the number of people you see in this photo, you will not be allowed to take the test. And then we see who is really paying attention to the instruction. All the people who click on three saying there are three people in the photo, which is technically correct, they are kicked out because they are not paying attention to the instructions. So this is kind of a trick to uh, take out uh, and careful mTarkers. What we also did, we insert a test pair. So definitely good matches and definitely bad matches. And if an mTarker got any of them wrong, we would kick that out. In the sense, we wouldn't consider their results in, uh, in, uh, in our evaluations. We also add at least uh, five graders uh, grade each pair. And pretty much here we have an histogram depicting the distribution of scores by pit path uh, in blue 
and the percentage of those uh, potential matches which uh, the MTARKers believe were a sure match in red. So what you see are values basically from 0 to 20, and you can see that most of the action happens in values between uh, 1 and 7. Uh, the highest scores are the ones which are sure matches, and in fact, uh, red covers uh, all of that. As you start going down in the scores, the blue, the rational blue increases because that means that more likely than not, those are not real matches found by the recognizer. At the end of the day, this is what we found. Sure matches, 6.2%. Sure matches plus highly likely matches, 10.5%. What does it mean, sure or highly likely? Sure uh, if uh, um, two thirds of our uh, MTAR graders gave a ranking of uh, this is a sure match. Highly likely if the majority of our graders gave a rating of sure match. So about one out of 10 users of the dating sites were potentially identifiable. Now, consider that we only use one single Facebook photo. It's like, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, only using the primary profile image coming from a search engine search. We only consider merely the first results found by the recognizer rather than, for instance, the top 10. This is very important because these recognizers can often be faked by some false positives. Sometimes the, the difference between two images is so little that maybe your best, uh, your real match is the second or the third or the fourth. Here, considerably, we focus on the first, but next, in experiment two, we consider an enlarged, different uh, model of attack. And of course, uh, as I discussed later in the big picture, uh, recognize their accuracy will keep increasing. The second experiment was offline to online. Uh, I wrote it correctly here. So once again, we use Facebook images, these times coming from uh, a uh, college network, to identify students who were strolling on campus. The college photos, so the students on campus, we took them with a webcam. So we had students to just stop by, um, we, we had set up a, a desk with two laptops on uh, in one of the campus uh, buildings. We had subjects who were passing by if they wanted to help us with an experiment. We took three shots, and then we asked them uh, to participate in a survey. Um, we compare their shots to Facebook profiles from the campus network. We had 25,000 profiles for a total of 260,000 images. Faces were detected by PitPat. In uh, 100, 114,000 faces were detected by PitPat. And the process was this. So the subject would uh, sit at the desk. And uh, um, as the photo was taken, the subject would start filling out a survey about uh, Facebook usage. Meanwhile, uh, the image was sent up to a cloud service, a cloud computing cluster, where the images were matched, the, the shot taken were matched against Facebook images. By the time the subject would reach the third and last page of the survey, that page had been dynamically populated with the top best uh, images found by the recognizer. And the participant had to click on, uh, yes, I recognize myself in this photo, or no, I do not uh, recognize myself in uh, this photo. So this is the schematics. We had two laptops. One was uh, uh, for the subject who was filling out the survey. The other laptop was for the experimenters because from here we were sending the image to the cloud and uh, getting back the results. So this is an example. Uh, one of my students allowed me to use his uh, photo for this case. This was an identif unidentified photo. And this is something we found on the Facebook. Uh, are you as good as the face recognizer? Yes, right? You can find uh, quite clearly the photo there. And 93 subjects participating in this experiment. The survey that they filled out tells us that they were all students and they were all Facebook members. And for 31% of them, we did find indeed a match. So one out of three uh, were uh, identified in this way, including one subject um, who told us right before starting, you will never find me. The reason was that he didn't have a photo of himself on Facebook, or so he believed. And this is an interesting story. We found him through an image made publicly available by one of his friends. And uh, the biggest story here is that it's not just how much you are revealing about yourself, it's also how much your friends or other people are revealing about you. 
The average computation time was less than three seconds. Pretty much it took much less time for the recognizer to find a match than for the student to fill out the survey and arrive to the last page uh, with the matches. And then we wanted to push the envelope because, okay, face uh, re-identification is interesting, but the story we want to tell is bigger than this. Um, here, what I've shown so far is that we can take an anonymous face online on the dating site or offline in the street, and we can find a Facebook profile, which arguably for 90% of people should give us their name. However, two years ago, when we were a black hat, we presented a study where we showed that we could start from a Facebook profile and end up predicting people's social security number. So it's a, it's a visual aid. What we had done so far is uh, we start from an anonymous photo, we use PitPat, we found a Facebook profile. But two years ago, what we did is we start from a Facebook profile, we take the deaf master file, which is public information, and we end up with someone's social security number. So you're seeing where I'm going with this, right? So as a quick uh, parenthesis, what we did two years ago was to show that the social security number assignment scheme, although public for many years, had been misinterpreted for many, many years. So people believed that there was much more random, randomness than what there really was. So if you try to predict someone SSN with the knowledge that existed before uh, we published the paper, uh, we, it, it would be really hard in the sense that you, the, the probability of getting the first digits right for someone, say, born in Alaska in 1998 would be, with one guess, 0.0014%. If you don't know where they're born, 1% if you do. The probability of getting the full nine digits with, say, 1,000 guesses would be also extremely, extremely low. But we showed that if we took deaf master file data, so data from uh, the social security number of people are dead, and we organize it chronologically, the x-axis here for Oregon and Pennsylvania, people born in 1996, the x-axis represent date of birth, and the y-axis represent the area number, the first digit, the group number, the mid two digit of your SSN, and the serial number, the last four digits. So if you organize them graphically, you start seeing very obvious patterns, such such as uh, group number remain constant over a period of time for people born in the same state over a certain period, uh, period of days. Area number cycle in a stepwise uh, uh, sequence. Serial number increase uh, linearly. And we did all of this, uh, and we found out that the accuracy of our predictions was much, much higher, not just for the first five digits, but also the last four, than what was believed before. So much so that brute force attacks on social security numbers were indeed possible. So this is what we wanted to do then in uh, the study. Uh, we uh, took Facebook profile, we took data from the deaf master file, say John Smith born in, uh, in July 87 in Jersey, John Doe also born in July in uh, New Jersey, and we compare it to John OSN, Online Social Network, who is not dead, therefore is not in the deaf master file, but happens to be also born in New Jersey and also born in July. And by a process of interpolation, we were able to end up predicting the social security number of John Online Social Network using the data from the other Johns who were instead dead. So going back to this study, uh, you see where I'm going. We take someone's face, anonymous, we found their Facebook profile, we end up predicting the social security number. So the story is predicting SSM from faces. But once again, uh, this is just an example. Uh, I want to stress that the reason we are doing this is really to think in terms of this blending of online and offline data, which I believe is inevitable five to 10 years out. So what we did, we tried to predict from faces, not only the um, SSM, but also the interest. We also wanted to add something easier to predict and less sensitive. So we asked participants in experiment two to participate in a new study. Uh, we used their Facebook profile to predict their interest and their personal information. And this is really a, fa a picture which tells a story. Like sometimes they say an image is worth a thousand words. So this is a, a little script that we, we wrote to, uh, in a way, visualize Facebook tags, okay? So this is an image with, where um, the tag uh, linking to a certain Facebook ID, so the numbers you see, is uh, correspond to a certain face. This is pretty much what happens when you are tagging people on Facebook. You are effectively creating these boxes with numbers on it. We are visualizing it because the story we want to tell is that these red boxes is uh, what Facebook puts, actually what you put through tagging. The white box is uh, what our identifier found. For instance, found a match for this face. 
And because we have the tag information, we can find her profile, and from there we can find the person information. So we call back uh, the, uh, the um, participants of experiment two. Not all of them wanted to participate in a new participant because some were understandably uh, slightly freaked out by the study. <laughs> Uh, although we, 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 I, I, we put all, all possible safeguards in place, uh, all, all studies were IRB approved, uh, no face and no SSN was harmed in the, in the process of doing these, uh, these experiments. Um, the, the way we, we, we did it, it was important for us that we would be able to get aggregate statistics of our, our prediction accuracy without being able to know whether a certain given subject had uh, uh, whether a certain given subject SSN was accurate or not, because we, we didn't want to be in the position of inferring the actual SSN of a subject. So we had to devise experiment in a way that we would only would get aggregate data, uh, which we did, and we also explained to the subjects. But some of them uh, didn't, felt, didn't feel uh, sufficiently comfortable, so they started and they stopped after reading what it was really about. For those who ended it, which was uh, close to 50% of those who started, uh, we got 75% of their, all their interests right. We got, if we use just two attempts for the first five digits, we got uh, close to 70% of, um, of the subjects right. If we use four attempts, we got close to 30% right. Now, this number may seem either large or low to you, depending on where I come from. I can tell you they're big, in the sense that if you use a random chance to predict the first five digits of someone SSN, with a single attempt, your, uh, your likelihood of getting right, as I showed in the previous slide, was 0 0.00014. So, experiment three was obviously asynchronous, in the sense that first we did experiment two in which in the campus building we took the photos and we found the profiles, then we said, okay, let's push the envelope, let's get, let's get more information from the profiles, let's read it as SSN, let's check with the subject whether that's okay. But of course, it's more fun to do it in real time, right? So we started working on a real time application. So a smartphone application, which in real times, tries to do what experiment two and three did. So predicting personal, even sensitive information from someone's face in real time on a mobile device. So this is the story. And forgive me if maybe by now this story should be completely obvious, but because it's so important to me that, the, that not only the numerical results come out of this, but really where we are going, I thought about using a graph. The term data accretion is a beautiful term that I found uh, uh, first in Paul Holm. Uh, many of you know Paul, he's a, he's a law scholar, uh, an expert on anonymity at uh, University of um, Boulder, uh, Colorado Boulder and talks about data accretion to refer to uh, this uh, domino effect where you start from piece of data A and then you infer data B. From B, you can infer C. From C, D. From D, E. And eventually, you discover something very sensitive, such as the social security number, even though you started from something very innocent, such as an anonymous face. Each step is obvious, but when you consider the, them in a, as a whole, it's surprising. So we start from the anonymous face. We found a matching face. From here, we get the presumptive name of the person. From the presumptive name, we use scripts to find additional information about that person, for instance, from USA People Search or Zaba Search or Spokeo.com. From this information, we then uh, use something else to predict very sensitive information, such as social security number, which you can then reconnect to the original anonymous face. So the matching face, as I mentioned earlier, can come from LinkedIn or from Facebook profiles. The presumptive name not always is so trivial, not always is so easy. If you find a LinkedIn profile, a matching image from a LinkedIn profile, you're pretty sure that you also have found the name of the person. If you find a matching photo from Facebook, the story is a little more complicated than what I've told you so far. I've been hiding some important details, such as the following. The fact that if you find a face on a Facebook profile, you not always know whether it's the face of the owner of the profile or of a friend. Imagine this photo. Let's say that I find a match for the girl on the left. Um, and this is the only photo I can find for a certain given profile. It's the primary profile photo of uh, Mary Johnson. Is that Mary Johnson? I do not know, because I cannot access additional photos about her. So how do we deal with the identification of the name started from a matching photo? Well, 
it's not obvious, so we try to write some algorithms for that, and then we test the, perfor the performance of the algorithms against human beings. So pretty much we did, uh, we took uh, um, 500, uh, only 433 actually, 433 templates randomly chosen from our set of Facebook profiles, and then we ask humans to find who they thought this person were in our script. And the script we develop uh, is based on a weighted combination of different metrics, such as does the template, so the face, have a tag? If it has a tag, usually the tag is very accurate. Is it in a primary profile photo? Is it in a cluster? When you do cluster analysis, so you combine many faces together, is it a larger cluster inside a, um, a, a Facebook profile? Under the assumption that the larger cluster is usually the one of the owner of the profile. Human coders were able to find the, for sure, we're able to be sure about the correct Facebook profile uh, in 46% of the times of this sample. The computer script we wrote was able to approximate the human behavior 63% of the times. So going back, you go through this process, you try to find the presented name, then you, once you have the name, you try to find additional information about the name. In example I'm about to show you, we use, for instance, USA People Search, which is an online people uh, search services, which can be used for free if you use it only moderately or for pay if we want to use it often. And then from this, you do predictions such as SSN, but also sex orientation, credit score, and so forth. We call it also the transitive property of person information, right? The idea that you go from A to B, from B to C, and so forth. So the real time demo, eventually, what it does is uh, going to. Um, Yes, it's going to also overlay the information obtained online over the image of uh, the individual obtained offline. And uh, this is a story of uh, augmented reality, right? So augmented reality is really, really cool because it's, uh, you start seeing these uh, amazing applications uh, developing for smartphones. Uh, this is an application which uses your GPS data and overlays, you point in a certain direction, overlays information taken online to what you're seeing offline in the real world. Another really cool application I've seen is called World Lens. I recommend anyone, everyone to check it because it's uh, what it does, you point it at a uh, text in Spanish, it translates it on your screen into English and vice versa. Uh, this is really cool, but of course we wanted to see whether we could use it also for our purposes. So we take uh, someone's face, a shot, uh, and then we overlay on that face uh, the name, the social credit number, and the interest. The nickname of the project is the wingman. <laughs> or the wing woman. Okay, so we are equally, <laughs> equally, um, okay. Um, and these are your snapshots. So let's see if we pray, if we pray the god of demo. Uh, uh, let's see if it works out. Um, if I tell you that he, if I tell you that it worked out uh, two hours ago, you believe me, it, it did, uh, really. I hope I didn't uh, uh, exhaust my uh, demo uh, um, bonus points uh, two hours ago when everything worked. It will take a few seconds first to go from one screen to the other. Okay, now we have uh, the screen up. And then, uh, let's see, it should go. Is it real time? Okay, so you can try. Thank you. So what, uh, the, what is happening now is that the, oh God, I need some sleep. Um, uh, okay, well, that, that was faster than I expected. So Alessandra Quisic, uh, CA. So what happened was the image was sent uh, uh, to a uh, server with uh, other, a database of uh, images. Um, these images were, are coded with names. Then uh, the server looked for the name online and queried a service called USA People Search, where it correctly found uh, that my first residence in uh, California was, uh, uh, sorry, my first residence in the United States and where I got my SSN was California. Thankfully, it didn't find when. So you can see that the date of birth uh, is empty and therefore there is no prediction for the SSN. Can I? Okay, you look better than me, way better. 
and in the case, knitting, okay, in the case of knitting, instead, this is a real social security number, so people, you can go ahead and uh, apply for credit cards right now on knitting's name. <laughs> Actually, it's not because we, in a room full of you, <laughs> we didn't want to. We didn't want to do it the real way, so we cheated with the last step. Uh, the social security number is uh, hard coded, and if any of you is a social security number nerd, you may have recognized that as an inside joke. That was the very thank you, Nitin. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Nitin actually developed the application, so thank you. Uh, it was the very first social security number ever issued by the Social Security Administration. So uh, if this sounds uh, cool, good, if this sounds, uh, sounds gloomy, I have some kittens just to <laughs> feel a little better. Okay. Now, where we were, uh, to tell you what was happening in real time and what was not happening in real time. Uh, uh, this was happening in real time. So we were taking the photo in real time and sending up to a server in real time. This was not happening in real time in the sense that we had hard-coded the database of images. Um, it was some, we, we downloaded them from the internet and, and we saved them. Uh, in the future, also this can be done in real time, I believe, and i tell you why in a few slides. Uh, this was done with a script in real time. This was done in real time in the sense that the script was really querying USA people's search and finding my California residence. And the SSM prediction kind of in real time in the sense that it was, but of course we, we, we didn't show the real SSM prediction. We, we hard coded a fake SSM for knitting. But the engine works in real time. The SSM prediction engine works in real time. So the limitations. Currently, there are many limitations. What I just show is merely a proof of concept. Uh, facial recognition is not yet there to a point where you can really recognize anyone everywhere all the time. But I'm afraid that it's going to get there. Uh, there are technical limitations and legal limitations to creating less, less large databases of images. Uh, computationally, because uh, you know you, you, you need to download massive amount of data legally, because well we use public information. If you want more, well you start getting into terms of service problems. Comparative subjects. In our experiment, we had people who were showing their frontal face. Recognizers notoriously get worse when you use non-frontal faces, for instance. And of course, if you're trying to identify someone in the street uh, without making that obvious, it's a little difficult to take a nice front of face and not be identified yourself. Geographical restrictions. So experiment one and two were about uh, specific communities. Large, hundreds of thousands of people, but not all the United States. The larger you go, the more computation time needed to do the face comparisons, and the more false positives, of course, you get from that process. However, even though clearly face identification and sensitive inferences everywhere, anytime, anybody is not yet reality, this is where we are going. And why I'm saying and thinking this? Well, yes, there are existing legal and technical constraints. However, many sources of public uh, data identify facial images are already out there. I would argue that you know, for most of us in this room, there are. Uh, tagging self as others is absolutely socially acceptable. It's become very, very common. And in fact, there are companies such as Face.com, which collaborate with uh, uh, Facebook, and they are discussing, almost boasting on their website, how they have already tagged and identified billions of images. So if someone, an external party, for a party, doesn't do it based on public value information, someone from inside one of the big companies uh, will do it. So. The other limitation, uh, facial visual shares, uh, oh yeah, Actually, extending the availability of personal information, I do believe the visual facial searches will become more common. Uh, what I mean by this, currently we have text-based searches. Search engines index text, uh, but they can well index images. And in fact, Google recently started talking about pattern-based uh, image search, although not yet visual images, uh, facial images. 
but we're really going to get there. Uh, think about uh, 1995. In 1995, the idea that someone could put a name, Alexander Christie, in something called a search engine, which didn't even exist, and find all the documents on the W, on the, uh, w Wide Web with the name was unthinkable. Maybe five years from now, visual searches and facial searches of the type I'm describing will be as common, even though they sound as unthinkable now as text-based searches were 10 years ago. And really, if you see at the trend I mentioned earlier with uh, Apple, Facebook, and, um, and Google going on a, on a shopping frenzy of startups doing face recognition, you obviously see where the commercial interest is. It's not going to stop. So the other issue, cooperative subjects. It's true, our subjects were cooperative. In experiment two, we had nice frontal photo. In experiment one, we have dating site profile photo where people use usually uh, frontal photo. Well, sometimes they use the, you know, the, the artistic shot from, from the top, but also that one is a face. But then again, uh, you can take frontal photo also without being noticed. You can use glasses. There is allegedly the Brazilian police will de deploy these uh, for the World Cup in 2014. And how long it will it take before we have it on contact lessons? Of course, it's impossible to develop now, five to 10 years out, Contact lenses that uh, in the street tell you what is the last blog written by the person you are just walking by. Is this so unthinkable? I don't think so. And then face recognizers keep getting better in so also in detecting non-frontal photos. We, as we were doing these experiments, a new version of PitPat came out. We started with PitPat 4.2. We got PitPat 5.2. We noticed just in the space of 10 months of development of PitPat, a dramatic increase in the ability of the recognizer to um, detect and recognize uh, side photos. Geographical restriction. The point that we were using a specific hundreds of thousands, but nevertheless specific community, while if you want to do it on a nation-wide scale, hundreds of millions of people, the computation time increases and the number of false positive increases. This is absolutely true, although also cloud companies keep getting faster and larger. More RAM means larger database you have available to uh, analyze, uh, as well as if the accuracy keeps increasing, the false number of false positives keeps decreasing. By the way, something else that we discovered as we were doing these experiments was the following. In reality, computers are so bad at recognizing images because we humans are also very bad. In the sense that when we put a human in a task where the only information they have is two, fossil, two photos of the face of a person, I can tell you it's really hard for some people to be recognized. Because we humans are so good in recognizing each other because we use all additional contextual cues, the body shape of the person, how they walk, maybe how they are dressed. Holistically, we capture this information in an instant and we use it to say, that's Richard. But when we only have a shot of a face, our ability of recognizing faces decreases. It's not just computers. And you know what? Online social networks are going there to provide these additional contextual cues. So this is why, at the start of my talk, uh, I was mentioning this idea of uh, Web 2 profiles as uh, de facto unregulated real IDs. And interestingly, the Federal Trade Commission, a few months ago, approved the Social Intelligence Corporation uh, a company which wants to do social media background checks. This suggests really this idea that we are starting accepting online uh, social network profiles is the real deal. It's the real veritable information about the subject. Now, this creates cool opportunity for e-commerce. Imagine the first picture I showed of a minority report where a gap uh, in the street can see you enter the store, connect your information from online because on Facebook you are a member of the Gap uh, fan club, uh, and so forth. And you don't have to wait 2054 for this. It will be five years from now or less. But there are really also ominous implications for privacy. And once again, I am a privacy researcher. I'm not in this to you know make a startup and uh, and uh, and. Uh, um, allow comp companies to track people. I'm here to raise awareness about uh, what is going to happen, what I feel is going to happen. And I feel that this uh, is uh, very concerning. And the reason is that if you consider the literature on privacy, in fact, also the literature on anonymity, uh, well known by most of you in this room, we are told to expect that anonymity loves 
crowds. We are anonymous in the crowd. Our privacy is protecting the crowd. But here we have a technology which is truly challenging our perception as well as our expectation of privacy in a physical crowd in the street because a stranger could know your last tweet just by looking at you and online in a dating site on prosper.com and so forth. We don't anticipate this because we are not evolved to think that strangers can recognize us, uh, recognize us so easily. Not only that, but I know from my other series of research, which is about behavior economics, which we cannot really anticipate the further additional inferences which become possible once you are re-identified. The problem is that there is no obviously clear solution to meet this problem that doesn't come with huge uh, unintended consequences. Uh, or simply which doesn't work. The ones which do not work are, for instance, opt-in or user consent. I find them ineffective because most of the data is already publicly available. Uh, Facebook, for instance, was mentioning earlier the case of primary profile photos being by default visible to all. Uh, regulation, but what type of regulation? Because do we want to stop researching face recognition? Obviously not. There is so much good that can come out for that. Finally, the bigger, one of the final, two final questions is what will privacy mean in this future? In the future of augmented reality where online and offline data blend. But not only that, if you allow me to extrapolate a little widely, to be a little bold, what also will mean for our interactions as human beings? What I'm talking about is the fact that we have evolved through millions of years to trust our instincts when we meet someone face to face immediately. Our brain, our biology, our senses tell us something about that person, whether the person is trustable or not whether we like that person or not, whether the person is young or old, cute or not cute, and so forth. Will we keep on trusting these instincts that have evolved over millions of years, or will we start trusting more the technology, our contact lenses, our glasses, that as we look at the other person, tell us something about that person? Now, do you get offended easily? Are you a crowd who gets offended easily? No? Can I go ahead with a, a, a stereotypical joke? Yeah? So then you can joke about me uh, that I'm Italian, I like pizza, and I play mandolin. Okay? So I don't. I play uh, keyboard, not mandolin, but I like pizza. Um, so this is the wingman, uh, the wingman application of face recognition. So they meet at a bar. And of course, they are using their iPhone to check each other out. Uh, OK, now I'm going to go really cheap on stereotype. And the guy is thinking, huh, I'm going to see if she's on adultfriendfinder.com. <laughs> and the girl, hmm, I'm going to check his credit profile. <laughs> so interestingly, in the, in the surveys we ran, we asked our subjects, both the experiment one, experiment three, what did you think about this? Uh, before we identified them, we asked them, what do you feel about these scenarios where people in the street could, uh, complete strangers, could know from your face uh, your credit score? Uh, almost everybody was freaked out. Well, at the same time, almost everyone is revealing online the information, which is precisely the information we use for this prediction. So we once again have this paradox. I'm not the first one to point it out, the paradox between attitudes and behavior. But in a way, I fear that this blending of online and offline data, that face recognition, cloud computing, online social network, and statistical re-identification are making possible, is pushing the paradox to its most extreme point, which is the unpredictability of what a stranger may know about you. And that's why I want to conclude with the themes I started from, because I really hope that the big story here are not the numbers, but is uh, what is going to happen five, 10 years out. Your faces, the conduit between online and offline world, the emergence of the personal predictive information, the rise of visual, facial searchers, search engine allowing people to search for faces like today you search for text, this democratization of surveillance, which is not necessarily a good thing, the social networks as de facto real ID, and the future of privacy in this augmented reality world. So let me conclude uh, suggesting that of these two futures, I, we started from together one hour ago. Uh, one is definitely creepy. Uh, perhaps both are creepy, in the sense that, personally, I don't want to live in a world 
if I had a choice uh, where anyone, uh, like in a Cheers, like in a bar, can know my name. If I go in a bar, I like them knowing my name, if they are my friends, not everyone. But we don't know which kind of future we are walking into, but we should better be prepared, and this is why we are doing this kind of research. And I want to thank uh, National Science Foundation, U.S. Army Research Office, Heinz College, Carnegie Mellon Cell Lab, and Berkman Fund at CMU for supporting this study. Uh, there was a little army of RAs uh, who helped uh, with this work, and Nitin uh, here represent them, and thank you again. Uh, I want to thank you very much for being here today. I'm asked to uh, uh, ask you uh, to sign up the forums. And if you want any more information, you can Google Economics of Privacy. Economics Privacy, you find my site. Uh, I thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.